Well, hi everyone. Thought it was time to do an update on the rebuilding of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, Maryland. There's been some recent uh, news developments, and uh, I'll go over those t today in detail. What's really exciting for me is they're at a stage of design and early construction that's uh, right up my alley, so they say, in terms of deep foundation testing, vibration monitoring, pre-construction survey, so I'll go over all of that. So as a reminder, the Francis Scott Key Bridge, the main span was destroyed by the cargo ship Dolly impacting one of its piers on March 26, 2024, killing six workers. In the aftermath of this collapse, officials had to clear the structural steel out of the Patapsco River, and since that time they brought in Kiwit, for design and construction associated with this project, construction services. So there's two key sources of information that I use to provide this update here today, and I'm recording this on July 12th, Saturday. There's a short video from Maryland Transportation Authority, and it was given by their chief engineer, who was talking through where they are in terms of preparing for final design, or I say final, they're at the near 50 to 70 percent level or will be fairly soon and uh, it was refreshing to see a very technically oriented individual representing a transportation agency on an important project for a change instead of a lot of these political statements that we get in other jurisdictions. Now to clarify, Maryland Transportation Authority is under Maryland Department of Transportation. Uh, Maryland Department of Transportation is the umbrella agency and MDTA has separate authority because of the tolls associated with these types of projects. Now I mentioned Kiwit. They gave a presentation on June 2nd of this year relating where they are in the overall process for the design and construction of this project. So we see here project owner Maryland Transportation Authority Delivery model, progressive design build. So they're designing as they go. Uh, Kiwit's designing this project themselves out of their engineering group. And Kiwit is also acting as the contractor. And they've mentioned here they've got an agreement in place with the local unions. So in progressive design build phase one, which is what they're nearing the end of now, typically includes completing the final design documents and providing recommendations regarding constructability, risk allocation, cost, and schedule and so on. Phase two typically includes the provision of recommendations to the agency on the planning, design, and proposed construction of the project as they apply to the final design documents. And this is what the conceptual renderings look like for the replacement bridge. It's going to be a cable stayed bridge. Quite spectacular. Obviously they're moving the piers over the main span farther from the main channel to reduce the effects or even likelihood of a ship collision with the piers. And as a reminder, we're just talking here bridge location on the Patapsco River southeast of downtown Baltimore. So they're getting ready to do several things right now. This is uh, Jim Harkness, their chief engineer for Maryland Transportation Authority. They've conducted over 100 borings to characterize the subsurface condition to support the design of not only the permanent structure, but structures associated with uh, temporary structures that you need to build in order to build the main bridge. Uh, a work trestle, for example. You can see they're working off a barge here to do the geotechnical exploration borings. And they're also implementing a test program consisting of open-ended pipe pile. And I'm going to go over this in a moment. I've done this exact same thing where I was involved with the project and we, the contractor was installing open-ended pipe pile to support their work trestle so that they can build uh, a flood wall in New Orleans. This is post-Katrina. These test piles to me look like they're about four feet in diameter. But a pile, as a reminder, develops its geotechnical resistance from side friction or adhesion on the side if you have clay soils and in bearing either with an internal soil plug that develops with an open-ended pile or you could have a closure plate, a closed-ended pipe pile, but again these are open-ended pipe pile. So I suspect that they will not be going to rock. And this is the program I mentioned post-Katrina. The contractor installed a series of pile for the work trestle location and I used these as test pile to confirm that the embedment depths were going to be appropriate, that we would develop the required capacity and so on. It was a critical phase of the project just as 
right now the, the test piles for Francis Scott Key bridge replacement are going to be critical for optimizing the design of both temporary and permanent foundations for that bridge. And that's a step that's not always taken on these projects, and I applaud Maryland Transportation Authority. I mean, I think they're doing a fantastic job on this project so far. This is a 30-inch diameter open-ended pipe pile that was used on that New Orleans project I worked on. This pile would sink about 80 feet under its own weight before they had to drive it. You see the five and a half foot diameter concrete pile that was used for the flood wall and the pipe pile that I mentioned you can see is sitting underneath this work platform, this trestle. So they have all their cranes and other construction equipment on the trestle so that they can install the piling for the flood wall. Now you get two types of information from a test pile program. One is to see how it drives. How big a hammer do you need? Uh, how easy or difficult is it to drive the pile to a given depth in the subsurface? But another key thing that can be done is dynamic pile testing, high strain dynamic testing that involves instrumenting the pile during driving with sets of strain gauges and accelerometers. And here is a radio to transmit the gauge readings to a data acquisition computer. You see here on top of one of these trestle pile. And oftentimes we are having to access the top of the pile using a man lift. And the first few times riding up in that 120 feet over water off a barge was, was quite uh, unnerving, but you get used to it. So as I mentioned, they often let these piles sink under their own weight. They install them a little farther with the vibratory hammer and then they would bring in an impact hammer, like this air hammer. Now I'm going to show you a quick video segment of doing dynamic pile testing on one of my projects in Kansas recently. So we've got our data acquisition computer, we've got our gauges on the pile. The pile's being driven with an open-ended diesel hammer. I'm getting data blow by blow on not only stresses in the pile, but also the resistance that resistance from the soil and rock on the piling. So we go through and back to the New Orleans project. We had less than 100 kips capacity on initial drive and those pile were driven to a depth about 125 feet. And then we come in a few days later and do a high strained dynamic test, a restrike PDA, to show the effects of time dependent capacity increases. And we went from around 120 kips on an initial drive to 600 kips on the restrike after a wait period of seven days. So if you need 600 kips, you don't need to make a 250 foot long pile to reach out on an initial drive. You could use a 125 foot long pile, for example, and allow for sufficient time for the capacity to develop within reason. I mean, a few days or a few weeks is plenty of time before that pile would be subject to any kind of loading. And this is just a plot of capacity over log time. And we found that doing restrike tests after a, a day or two actually disturbed uh, the capacity and we got capacity lower than the trend. So we learned to just do an initial drive test and then do the restrike at least a week later. So I imagine the program in Maryland for the Francis Scott Key Bridge indicator pile program or test pile program is going to be very much like this. Another thing that they're doing for the Francis Scott Key Bridge project, which we do in the normal course of our services, is pre-construction surveys. So in this case, officials there canvassed over 1,100 properties. And what you want to do is you want to define a zone some distance from your bridge construction where there'll be vibration inducing activities, whether it's demolition, uh, pile driving, that sort of thing. So you go through and you take pictures and videos and document existing cracks that are visible on uh, wall surfaces, on floor surfaces and so on. And then you install vibration monitors and also typically noise monitors because people will often complain about noise from pile driving or demolition activity and understandably so. So you want to make sure that you're within reasonable limits during the construction activity to not unduly disturb nearby residents and businesses. And this is an enclosure for one of these vibration monitors. Often have solar panels so you don't have to use uh, hardwire power. And they're often equipped with cellular modems so that you can get data sent back if a threshold level is exceeded for vibration 
or for just the daily update, what the readings were throughout the day. As part of your pre-construction survey, you can install crack monitors and go back post-construction or at other stages during construction to see if the crack is changing in width. Now let's get back to the status of the schedule on this project. As I mentioned, they're nearing the end of their phase one activities. So they're wrapping up their initial 50 to 70% level design, and then they'll have various bid packages go out to subcontractors for key aspects of the construction for the new bridge. Then they've got to install the work trestle, the bridge to build the bridge, and they've got about a nine month period of demolition of all the approach spans. So as a reminder, the main span was taken out by the dolly and subsequent debris removal, but now they've got all these approach spans that have to be removed, and that's going to take, again, about nine months. So I think, objectively, Maryland officials are doing a great job, along with Kiwit, on this project. Just as a basis of comparison, to give you an idea, I'm going to mention the Francis Scott Key Bridge in relation to another bridge replacement project that I've covered extensively on this channel. But the Francis Scott Key Bridge, the total length is 8,636 feet. And the collapse of the main span on the Francis Scott Key Bridge occurred a little over three months after Rhode Island DOT had to close the westbound Washington Bridge on an emergency basis because they suddenly discovered the bridge wasn't safe for travel. And they're in the midst of wrapping up their demolition and sometime in the next year they'll actually start construction on the replacement bridge, but that bridge is only 1,900 feet long. So this Francis Scott Key Bridge is four times the length as the Washington Bridge. The current schedule is for the Francis Scott Key Bridge to be completed and open to traffic in October 2028. Based on the current schedule for the Washington Bridge, RIDOT has stated they expect that bridge to be completed in November of 2028, so a month later. And uh, Francis Scott Key Bridge Replacement Project is expected to cost between $1.7 and $1.9 billion. And the Washington Bridge Project is expected to cost about a fourth of that at over $400 million. But we'll see with that. But it just gives you an idea of the relative size and scope between the two projects and the fact that essentially Maryland officials are building a bridge four times bigger in a period of time that's less than what Rhode Island DOT will have to complete their bridge. So going back to this test pile program for the Francis Scott Key Bridge, it looks like they're using at least four foot diameter open-ended steel pipe pile. So I'll submit records requests as these results come in and share them with you because I'm extremely interested in it. You know, the links, the capacities, how much time it takes for the bulk of the capacity to develop following installation and so on. So please keep in mind I do this type of work all over the country but primarily in the Midwest. Uh, dynamic pile testing, we do drill shaft testing, this is construction phase testing during bridge construction, we do the vibration monitoring and pre and post construction condition surveys. I'll have my contact information in the description to this video so with that, I want to send a shout out to those of you who've contributed to buy me a coffee. That's an excellent way to support the channel. I also want to send a thank you to the channel members, as well as those of you who've provided super thanks. Both of those are also additional great mechanisms for supporting the channel. Again, I'll continue to follow this bridge replacement story for the Francis Scott Key Bridge, so please stay tuned for future videos.